Hi everyone and welcome back to this week's episode of What's a Crime? You are listening here with Gráinne. Uh, unfortunately Gemma cannot be with me in person today so she is joining me remotely. Hi Gemma. Hello, I hope you can hear me. <laughs> I think that we could hear you all right. <laughs> so, um, Gemma, you can just sort of listen in. Um, I am telling the story today. Um, it's an American um, crime. Um, it is a story of Sherry Rasmussen. Okay. So, Sherry was born on February 7th, 1957. She was brought up in Tuscan, Arizona. Um, she had a very, very close-knit family. So, her father, Nels, was a dentist. Her mother was called Loretta. And then she had two sisters, Connie and Teresa. So, she was the middle child. But she and her sisters were like, you know, the apple of her parents' eyes. They were their pride and joy. Um, they supported and loved all of their children unconditionally. And Sherry and her sisters were also very close. So they were like, you know, really close as sisters, but they lived together at different points in college and stuff. Um, and they were also very close as friends as well as sisters. Not like, okay. not like us. <laughs> I wouldn't know how that thing is. Good for her. <laughs> Sherry was extremely bright. She was really, really intelligent and she decided to pursue nursing. So um, she looked up to like her older sister, Connie. She was also studying nursing. She attended La Sierra College uh, where she was only 16 as a freshman because she actually skipped a few grades due to her high intelligence. Um, She got her nursing degree whilst also working as a nurse in the college hospital and she was then admitted to a master's program in nursing in UCLA and she was only 23 when she was officially credentialed as a cardiovascular clinical nurse specialist, which is a huge achievement at such a young age. Yeah. Um, Nels, which was Sherry's father, um, he purchased a condo for her in Van Nuys in August 1980. Um, he, sorry. Nice. I wouldn't mind that. I know. I know. Um, he sort of liked the neighborhood where, um, where it was, it seemed very safe and the complex was relatively secure. So although it was issued in his name, she, their plan was that she would write a check to him every month equal to the mortgage payment. So although he was obviously really helping her out, um, she still wanted to be relatively independent and that was their way of, you know, coming to that agreement. Okay. In May 1984, she met a man called John Rutten at her friend's party. So the first thing John noticed about Sherry was her good looks. So she was tall. She was very attractive. And when they got to talking, John sort of realized that there was more than meets the eye. She was not just, you know, extremely accomplished professionally, but she was nice. She was kind. They got on really well. Um, And soon after this, they became a couple. John was delighted to call someone like Sherry his girlfriend um, and the two married on November 24th, 1985. So okay, and what what did what was John? What did he do? John was like a um, computer. I have his job here somewhere, but I do, a computer person. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have it here somewhere, but I can't remember exactly. But I'll get to it shortly. I think he was like an engineer or something. So um, John moved into Sherry's condo that Nell purchased. Um, they were going to live there together. Um, So it was like a middle class community in the heart of San Fernando Valley. So Nels didn't exactly dislike John. Um, He just sort of didn't feel like he was a great fit for Sherry. She was very focused and very driven. And from what I can sort of gather, Nels kind of, you know, he kind of seemed to think that John was sort of meek, you know, to find a better word. Like he was kind of undecisive and... um, but he did respect Sherry's decision and her choices, and he knew that she obviously loved John. Um, on the other hand, John also found Nels, which was Sherry's father, to be quite intimidating. Like, he was over six foot tall and broad, and he was very opinionated, and he was very, very protective of Sherry. Okay. On Monday, 24th of February, 1986, while John was getting ready to go to work, 
Sherry said she was thinking about calling in sick to the hospital. So at this point, she was sort of teaching classes and stuff. Um, and she was, she, like I said, at this point, she was only 27 years old. So she was extremely established nurse um, and she had a very impressive career. She was a director of nursing at Glenvale Medical. Um, John's job, <laughs> this is where I was getting to, John <laughs> had started a new job about six weeks earlier as an engineer at a company called Micro. Pulley, I think that's how you say it, um, which made computer disk drives. So on this right. particular morning, yeah, this that's what he told. <laughs> on this particular morning, um, he left Cherry. He went to work and he promised to give her a call and check up on her, which he did at around ten a.m. Um, but she didn't answer the phone. Uh, a little later, later on, he tried again. Um, but again, no answer. So he then called the hospital and spoke with Sherry's secretary, Sylvia. She told him that Sylvia was out of office. Um, she assumed teaching a class. So he wasn't that concerned. Sher- that Sherry was out of office? Yeah, yeah that she was teaching okay. a class or something. He wasn't concerned at all. He was more so a little bit sort of annoyed that she wasn't answering the phone. Um, he finished work at around 5 p.m., and on his way home, he ran a few errands, like picking up dry cleaning and stuff. So he's obviously had no real sense of urgency to get home. He kind of just thought everything was fine. <laughs> when, what way did you say errands? A few errands. What did I say? Errands? A few errands. Is that not how you say it? You don't say errands. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> like, <laughs> maybe I'm watching too much American TV. I'm pretty sure that's not even how they say it in American TV. <laughs> okay, you know what? Anyway, he ran a few errands. Um, <laughs> errands. <laughs> okay, anyway, back to the point. So he pulled in from work that night, um, but at this point he sort of sensed that something was wrong. So their unit's garage door was open, which was unusual, and there was no car parked inside. So... Um, John and Sherry had gotten um, a BMW and um, he knew that she, there was no reason for her to be out in the car because she called in sick, like where would she have gone? But um, more sort of alarming, the pavement in front of the garage door was um, strewn with broken glass. So he's sort of thinking, um, he's remembering a few months ago when she had like a minor driving mishap and she clipped her car went back and out of the garage and he wondered if she had done it again. Um, they did have a burglar alarm system installed just two months earlier, but they sort of only really armed it when they were both out or before they went to sleep. And when he left for work that morning at about 7.20 a.m. when she was still in bed, he hadn't thought to set the alarm or even lock the front door. So it's not, I mean... If you're home, you know, like I, I probably wouldn't, you know what I mean either, if someone's yeah. sort of up and awake and it's not night time. So yeah. his unease deepened further when he seen that the door at the top of the stairs was open. So he walked in and he seen Sherry lying on her back in the middle of their living room, which was in disarray. A shelf of their entertainment wall unit had collapsed. A corded telephone and pieces of from a broken vase were strewn on the carpet all around her. Her face was badly bruised. Her left eye was open and unblinking. Her right eye was swollen shut and crusted with blood. Um, oh my God. John tried to find a pulse, but he couldn't. So he picked up the phone, dialed 911 and said, I think my wife is dead. So he was... He was completely in shock um, and he was so disturbed by her facial injuries and how disfigured she looked that he didn't even notice that there was three gunshot wounds to her chest. So oh the God. wait to, for someone to come was only a few minutes, but obviously to John that felt like forever. Um, the ambulance arrived at 6.08 p.m. John was standing near the front door crying when they came in. Um, Sherry's blunt force trauma to her face was so extensive that the paramedics, like John, didn't initially notice the gunshot wounds. She, however, had no pulse and there was nothing that they could have done at that point and she was pronounced dead at 6.10pm. So once it was clear that she was dead, the paramedics stepped back from the body so as not to disturb any evidence 
and the police were called to the scene. So the LAPD arrived on the scene at 6.20 p.m. There didn't seem to be any forced entry based on the undamaged condition of the door and the locks. And the detective's initial impression was that Sherry was killed during a burglary. So, like, Los Angeles around that time was terrorized by crime like burglaries rapes murders were very very common it was sort of the era and the area of the night stalker do you remember um that guy who sort of crept into people's homes at night when they slept um richard ramirez so he he killed like 14 people um and it was sort of around that time so the crime was at an increasingly high rate um but obviously they had to eliminate john as a suspect so they had to interview him he was extremely distraught when they went to talk to him. You know, his emotional demeanor, his expressions, his physical reactions convinced the detectives that he wasn't involved in Sherry's murder. At 1 a.m. on the morning of Tuesday, the 25th of February, Nels and Loretta, which was Sherry's parents, got a call. It was from Richard Rutten, who was John's father, and he informed them that Sherry had been killed. So their whole world stopped. Like they were in shock. They were, of course, like as you can expect, they were absolutely devastated. They also couldn't understand why it took the um, it took John six hours, you know, for someone to let them know that their daughter was dead. Um, yeah, right now. I know they were just so they of course every emotion under the sun um they felt and he hung up and he went to get a flight straight to Los Angeles but at that point all the flights um had already left until the following day so he was like if had I had known I could have got you know the the flight before um it was the last one so they were just so so heartbroken anyway. Yeah. So evidence of an intense physical struggle was nearby. There was blood smeared on the floors, on the walls. Um, they found a multicolored blanket, which was a handmade quilt that Sherry had received from her grandmother as a Christmas gift one year. So it was a quilt that she had sort of made that had sewn like armholes and sleeves into it so she could wear it like a jacket. You know, like we would wear like snuggies, you know, around the house. Like yeah. We call them now. Um, In the days after the murder, the quilt was examined and found to have several bullet holes and gunpowder residue in it. So subsequent forensic testing supported that the quilt was wrapped around the murder weapon before the gun was fired as a makeshift silencer to muffle the sound of the fatal gunshots. Because obviously they lived in a complex like they had neighbours. Yeah. On examination of her body, a criminalist noticed a bite mark on her left forearm. Um, He swabbed it for evidence, even though at the time DNA was not really a household term. Um, There was no injuries to suggest that she had been sexually assaulted. And she also sustained three gunshot wounds in her chest in addition to the bite mark and her facial injuries. Um, The third gunshot in the centre of her chest had the hallmarks of a contact gunshot wound which meant that basically the gun was pressed to her body when the trigger was pulled um the the coroners and that said that any one of the gunshots would have killed her on thursday afternoon april the 10th 1986 a resident of the complex at balboa boulevard which was just a quarter of a mile south of where sherry was killed came home and discovered her front door ajar inside were two male burglars the resident, who was a woman in her late 20s called Lisa Rivali, shouted at the men, obviously, to get out of her house. One of the burglars was armed with a revolver, which he pointed at her before she ran and fled to a neighbour's and then called the police. So both suspects, according to Lisa, were listed as male. One was Mexican, described as 40 years old, 5 feet 4, 160 pounds, with black hair, brown eyes and a pot belly. The other was described as between 20 and 24 years old, 5 feet, 130 pounds, black hair and brown eyes. So detectives were of the opinion that the suspects who burgled this residence were the same suspects that committed the burglary and the murder of Sherry. So... This idea formed 
And these men were sort of at the forefront of the suspects that that killed Sherry. So yeah. unfortunately for Sherry, John and Sherry's family, the suspects were not apprehended and nobody was identified as um, Sherry's killer. Oh my God, they didn't get them? No, they didn't get them. Um, Nels and Loretta, they initially funded a reward for information which was publicised um, in October 1986 and then again November 1987, but nothing came of it. So they literally were, they did everything that they could to get Kerry's sh- case constantly looked at, constantly in the media. They met with like a, a true crime best-selling author to get her interested in Sherry's case. They sent a letter to LAPD chief of police in 1988. His name was Daryl Gates. They begged him to intervene um, in her unsolved murder case um, because they didn't want any of the detectives to neglect any leads. Um, They got no response from that. They called into different police departments to try and get um, information because they couldn't really get anything out of the LAPD. Um, So I, on sort of researching this and talking about it, and when the family looked back, they sort of felt like they were treated differently than John because they felt like the police had spoken to John first and that they already had like a premeditated idea of what her family were going to be like and the way Nels, because Nels was a very, he was a tall man, he was very opinionated, he was very, you know, um, what's the word, like he was intimidating um, and she okay. sort of felt like they already had an idea and so therefore they were almost sort of froze out of all the information, which obviously is like they're her parents, they're her family, like her sister. And like I said, they were so close knit as well. Um, it just yeah. wasn't fair on them. Um, they turned to um, the television the television show, sorry, um, America's Most Wanted as well. Um, they sent a letter which detailed other possible circumstances and motives aside from a random bur- burglary. But again, they heard nothing back from that. And despite the fruitlessness of all of their efforts, they refused to give up hope that Sherry's case would be solved. In 1992, they even had a, a meeting with the detectives on the case to ask if they would run DNA. So the police told them it was too expensive. Um, and Nels said, I'll pay for it. I have the money. Um, they then said it didn't matter because they didn't have a suspect anyway to compare DNA oh to. Oh my God, this is so frustrating. I know because Nels is literally like her father is th- at the forefront of keeping her case in like the the limelight and, and making sure that it gets solved. And again... And why wouldn't they run DNA they, they, like- they basically said it's too expensive to which Nell, Nell's offered to pay and then they said um, no again because they didn't have a suspect to you know compare DNA anyway so years passed and the case unfortunately went cold in 2001 LA police chief Bernard Parks created the cold case homicide unit to begin s- systematically combing unsolved murders for DNA evidence So obviously the the crime rate in LA, like I told you, was quite high, Um, but by this time, 2001, um, it had really started to come down quite a lot. So they wanted to go back over all of the unsolved homicides. And obviously at this point, DNA was um, available so that they would be able to, you know, get people that way. So. Three years after that, again, um, a lady called Jennifer Francis, who was a criminalist with the unit, she pulled Sherry's case and she began sorting through what was there. So this was sort of a, a matter of routine, but the rest of what happened was not. So the crime report stated that a swab had been taken from the bite mark on Sherry's arm. So at this point, obviously, like I said, they could use DNA. So she called the coroner's office where they didn't have the swab on file. So they decided to search the freezers by hand. And miraculously, the swab was found. Um, it was God. found in a manila envelope that had absorbed moisture from the freezer walls. And over time, the corner of the envelope um, with the case number on it had worn away. But they still could see her surname, Rasmussen, written on the front. Um, so she ran tests and she got lab results back in late January, 2005. 
So she ran the DNA signature through CODIS, which was the um, law enforcement database, and there were no hits. But the results did show something curious. The bite on Sherry's arm had been made by a woman. So this sort of completely turned Sherry's case on its head because this whole time it had been theorized that two male burglars had broken and killed Sherry. So now they were discovering that it was a female that had bitten Sherry on that day. So... Frances, who is the criminalist that found this information out, she took this result back to the cold case detectives, um, pointing out that if Sherry had been killed by a woman, it completely upended the theory that it was um, a burglary by two men gone wrong. So she's like, you know, this entire case should be reinvestigated, but the detective did not agree. He's sort of like, well, you know, probably one of the burglars was a female and... She's like, well, I mean, it's possible, but it's not really typical. And unfortunately for her, um, the evidence went back into storage, presumably forever. That was at least for another four years until February 2009, when the Rasmussen case surfaced once again. So... The detectives in the homicides unit, like I said, are given cold cases for review um, in addition to the current murders that they're working because, like I said, the murder cases had fallen off um, in Los Angeles in, in recent years at this point. So a Van Noyes homicide detective, Jim Nuttall, he had like a row of, like they're called murder books. They're like um, books that have all of the information about certain cases, like photos, you know, transcripts, all of that stuff. Yeah. A detailed account, basically, of everything about the case. And one of the books that he had was for the Rasmussen case. And in reviewing it one day, he saw the same sort of contradiction that that criminalist, that Lady Jennifer, had seen, that um, the DNA report showed that the suspect killer was actually a woman, even though the whole time it had been theorised that it was two men that had killed Sherry. So he recognises the significance of this DNA report from the moment he read it. So LAPD, um, LAPD detectives, they don't get a lot of female on female homicides, um, nor really any home invasions committed by women because, you know, obviously most of those... Um, are committed by men. So the okay. fact that the narrative, you know, centered on two male burglars, it completely didn't line up with the new evidence that they'd find. So the first area that comes to his mind before he's even gone through everything is a love triangle, you know, a woman killed a woman, like that's sort of yeah. he's thinking what motives is here. So he was struck enough um, by finding this information to report it to his supervisor, Detective Robert Bubb, who assigned two other detectives to the case, Mark Martinez and Pete Barba. So they all sort of decide they're going to rework this case uh, together. So they study this murder book and they sort of see a different story from the one pieced together by detectives in 1986. Um, they sort of reconstructed the event um, that Cherry had not been surprised by burglars working downstairs, that she herself had been surprised upstairs by an armed intruder. So like I said, the front door showed no signs of having been forced and the alarm was off. So she wouldn't really have heard anyone entering if they did it you know, stealthily enough. And she was confronted by the intruder upstairs. Two shots were fired at her that missed, shattering the sliding glass door. The glass was bowed slightly outward, consistent with rounds travelling in that direction. So whoever had come looking for Sherry had come to kill her. Okay. So she had apparently run downstairs, trying to reach the panic button on the security panel. Killer pursued her and stopped her before she got there. They fought savagely and she apparently managed to briefly, um, you know, wrestle her assailants, gone away and then place her in a headlock. This is where the killer then bit her forearm to break free, picked up the um, heavy grey ceramic vase from the living room shelf and crashed it hard into her forehead. 
This blow oh was enough to daze Sherry, if not knock her to the floor. The killer then retrieved the gun, fired the first shot that hit Sherry. It went clean through her chest and um, she would have had only minutes to live after this. So using the blanket to muffle the sound, the killer then fired two more rounds into her chest, finishing the job. So with all of the information, with the crime scene, with her injuries, this is what they summarised happened, which really fit more into um, what fit more into the crime scene than the previous. It makes more sense. It makes more sense, exactly. And, you know, the DNA work showed without a doubt that the killer had been a female. So the Van Nuys detectives wondered what woman in Sherry's life wanted her dead. So the detective called John Rutten, first of all, which was Sherry's husband, and interviewed him over the phone. He asked John if there was any woman in his past with him um, that Sherry might have had a conflict with before her murder. So he's sort of like, "Mm, not really. Like, I did tell the police all those years ago um, that before me and Sherry married, I was involved in a on again, off again relationship with a woman called Stephanie Lazarus. So John said that Stephanie had been a police officer and joined the LAPD before he met her, uh, or sorry, before he met Sherry. And as far as he knew, she still worked there. He said that, you know, he didn't believe Stephanie had done anything um, wrong. He was like, we were really good friends. I don't think she would have done anything. But she has been Nell's theory from the very start. Nell's being Sherry's father. Sherry's father, okay. Yeah. So the detectives are like, okay, so they type her name into the online LAPD directory and find a listing for a detective named Stephanie Lazarus. So the directory indicated that she was currently assigned to the Commercial Crimes Division um, of Parker Centre, LAPD headquarters, downtown. So she wasn't just a cop at this point. She was an esteemed detective. She had been promoted and commended many times over the years for her work. Um, Her husband, Scott, um, who she was now married to, even shared the same locker room as Nuttall, Martinez and Bob, who are the three detectives I was telling you about that now are investigating this case. So they're like, okay, this is very, very close to home for us to be actually investigating this. Um, John told the detectives that he'd you know, he's like, I've already told the detectives in 1986 about Stephanie. Um, but there had been no indication that she had ever even been interviewed in 1986 or at any time since then. So the detectives sort of have to make a decision, a decision before they proceed any further with the investigation. So um, police uh, required all employees to immediately report uh, to either internal affairs or another officer the strict responsibility to report misconduct as soon as it came to light. So that had been like drilled into them from their very first days at the academy and throughout their careers. But at the same time, they're sort of like, okay, if we do report her, then we risk tipping her off. And also, she might not have even done anything. She could be completely innocent. And if they go reporting her, you know, they're going to like sully her name. And she's an, an esteemed detective at this point. Yeah. So they decide to oh, what they? they decide to contact her friends and her family, um, Sherry's friends and family. Sorry, and um, they're sort of like, look, do you guys have any idea who would want to hurt Sherry? Um, Sherry's father, Nels, informs him that he felt the person responsible for his daughter's murder was a female LAPD officer who had dated John before he met Sherry. He said that um, Sherry had confided in her parents, um, Nels and Loretta, that this woman was harassing her, had showed up unannounced at her work, had showed up unannounced at their home. And he said, Nels is like, I've told the police about this woman so many times from the very beginning. I was always ignored. They never, ever investigated her. And like, I don't understand why. So... The detectives are like, okay, well, they both mentioned this lady, Stephanie Lazarus. So they're like, right, okay, let's try to imagine how a cop with training might go about planning to murder someone. So 
she wouldn't do it on duty. She would do it on a day off because obviously they travel with their partners when they're on duty. Um, and, you know, to get away from your partner to murder someone, it's not going to be easy. So mm-hmm. she would have been off work. She would have to be very careful. She would have to know when the victim was going to be alone. She would want to leave the scene in a way that minimized being seen clearly enough to be identified. So she entered the garage from the inner door and would have driven away inside Sherry's BMW. Um, there was also the murder weapon. So um, the the detectives are like, you know, they kind of doubt that she would plan to commit murder with her duty gun. Um and she would want to get rid of any sort of um, gun afterward if she did, because if they lose one of their guns, if any of the police that, you know, have a, a duty gun and they will be in trouble if they lose it, basically, is what I'm trying to say. Um, yeah. So the the Van Nuys detectives, they knew that most cops do carry at least two weapons, a duty gun and a backup gun. Um, so records show that... Stephanie had purchased a 38 caliber Smith & Wesson soon after graduating from the police academy. Um, and they're sort of like, okay, if she used um, the gun in the murder, she would have obviously have had to get rid of it because if she became a suspect, the first thing they're going to look for is the gun and it's going to look really suspicious if she's like, mm, I don't know where it is. So in the 1980s, most LAPD officers did carry a 38 as their backup gun, which was also the same caliber as the bullets recovered during Sherry's autopsy. On April 30th, the detectives run Stephanie's name through a California database um, of registered firearms, and it showed that she did own a 38 Smith & Wesson revolver, but she had reported it stolen in Santa Monica on March 9th, which was just 13 days after after the murder so she contacted the um, Santa Monica Police Department and um, they obtained a copy of the crime report which um, she put in in 1986 and it said that she had reported the gun stolen from her parked car um, and then nine days after that she purchased a brand new 38 Smith and Wesson revolver so um, they're sort of like okay like it's starting to look a little bit suspicious. Um, yeah. They didn't want anyone to know in their in their Van Noy's office to know about it yet because information obviously travels fast in an office and stuff. So as soon as they sort of are really now considering her a possible suspect, um, they call their superior who's like, look, you really need to treat this as confidential. Like nobody can find out that you are... Um, investigating this woman so um, four months later um, it's authorised that um, an internal affairs group um, special operations section is basically basically what I'm trying to say is they are now authorised to basically investigate Stephanie further so now they're like they're authorised to get a DNA sample from her so they're like okay we have to do this very carefully very surreptitiously without ticking her off and in order to avoid um you know suspicion um they basically um start round the clock surveillance of her so there's two teams that are basically shadowing her wherever she goes at home when she goes out somewhere um they're basically waiting for her to discard something that might have her dna on it so Stephanie, um, she had an, ad- an adopted daughter at this point as well. They um, are going on a trip to Costco one day from their house. So they travel to the supermarket and then they snacked at a table outside. And um, one of the detectives that was watching her that day after she had left, he retrieves the cup and the straw that she had used um, that day. So two days later, the lab confirmed that the DNA on the straw was the DNA that had bitten Sherry Rasmussen's forearm in a violent struggle 23 years ago. Oh my God, 23 years later. So yeah, they're like, oh my God, like she did it. Um... So to tell you a little bit about Stephanie before we get on to what happened next, she was born in Santa Monica in 1960. She was the eldest of three. So she initially met John at UCLA, which is where they went to college together um, in 1978. 
She was very outgoing. She was assertive. Um, her and John had common interests in sports. They would go runs together. They would play basketball together. And some of their friends noticed that she seemed to want more than a platonic relationship with John. So John's sort of perspective was that he kind of is like, yeah, like we're sort of friends, we're sort of dating, but it's kind of like a gray area. Um, but they're very close. Like she met John's family. She went to their, his home many times. Um, and even his family sensed that she liked him more than he liked her. So okay. when she first heard of his engagement to Sherry, she was very upset. Um, so one evening, a few weeks after um, Stephanie learned of John's engagement, he received a phone call from her at his apartment. So he and Sherry had already agreed that they were going to move in together at that point, but they hadn't actually done it yet. So um, Stephanie rang him. She was on the phone crying. She was like, I want to see you. And John's like, OK, he goes over to see her and she confesses. Her feelings to him that she loves him, she wants to be with him, and John's like, "Look, like I'm engaged to Sherry, I love her, like we can't be together." Um, she told him she wanted to have sex with him one last time, and they did end up in bed together. Um, oh my god! I know, John. John. And John sort of didn't tell Sherry about the encounter. Obviously, he's trying to like, obviously, yeah, this is a prick. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, it's true. Well, it's true. Um, <laughs> so Stephanie then um, goes to visit Sherry at Glendale Adventist Medical Center. So this is where Sherry works. So Sherry recounted this visit to her parents um, about how John's ex had come to her office uninvited. She said that the woman wore a tight top and shorts and was dressed, quote, very provocatively, unquote. And she thought that the woman wanted to show her that she worked out and was in top shape. So she told Sherry that John had come to see her and that they had had sex and that she's like, I know what John wants. I know John so well. When this marriage fails, I'm going to be there to pick up the pieces. Um, just really horrible like you know Sherry sort of is really really upset she actually goes home crying um, her, her secretary Sylvia said so she obviously goes home she confronts John and she's like look what happened here and he's like okay he admits his infidelity he said he'd made a terrible mistake and he begged her for forgiveness so She agrees to move on and leave Stephanie in the past. So John's like, look, she's like, look, you need to contact this woman, completely end things. And he's like, no, like, I'm just not going to contact her again um, because I feel like it might add fuel to the situation. So I'm just going to let it lie. Um, However... That wasn't the only time that she barged back into their lives. She showed up at their ho- their home unannounced on two more occasions. So one when John was home and she showed up with like ski ski equipment and asked John to like wax them or something. And he was like, like, this is where I get like, one, wax. like wax her ski equipment. <laughs> like what? Can you not hear me? <laughs> No. She asked John basically to, to do her a favor and he... He does, which is where I get where, you know, Nels is like, oh, he's a bit washy-washy. Like, he's a bit sort of meek because Sherry is standing there being like, no, don't do it. Don't take this off her. Like, don't do her this favor. And he's like, oh, I'll just do it. Like, it'll be, you know, I'll I'll basically sort of. No, you you actually slept with her when you're engaged. I know. I know. She's not like near my house. She's not. Why are you you doing this for her? Exactly. So. And then she showed up another time at their house um, unannounced and John wasn't there and Sherry, being having more backbone than John, tells her to get out and leave their life. Um, so she she did tell her father, Nels, about the harassment, but she didn't want to humi- humiliate, humiliate herself anymore, so she didn't tell anyone that John had been unfaithful, so nobody else knew that John had slept with Stephanie. And, you know, she also sort of, she had forgiven him. She'd taken him back. So she didn't want people to have a, a poor opinion of John. Um, and she never even told anyone 
this woman's name. So all that Nels knew about this woman was that she was an LAPD female um, officer. And, you know, that's why he couldn't understand why nobody had taken him, had taken his his thoughts on board. You and know, also John, too, being like, oh, I don't think she would have done it. I know. Like, like how did that cop on, John? I think John just literally has a little bit meek, which is not a nice thing to say, but he's just sort of like, oh, do you know what I mean? Um, hmm. Stephanie now Stephanie was a strong woman she was in excellent physical shape she was naturally assertive she endured grueling training sessions firearms, self defence combat wrestling she was regarded as among the toughest combat Battants in their class when they were at the academy for the LAPD. So although Sherry was also in excellent physical condition, um, it sort of shows that a, a long, violent struggle between two women was so much more plausible than had it been Sherry against two men with a firearm. Do you know what I mean? Like when, yeah. they, when they're sort yeah. of saying there was a long struggle, like it makes more sense that it was and too like, physically fit. Nothing, was there anything even taken from the house? That's the other thing. Or? Yeah, that's the other thing. So I think one of the only things that they could really tell that was taken was um, was their marriage certificate, which was stolen out of Sherry's purse. So why would someone come and steal their marriage certificate? Like, why? what are two male robbers going to do with that? So, yeah. Very, very strange, and also so weird that she could definitely see that. Exactly, like, like she must have been absolutely up. obsessed. Um, at this point, obviously, um, they know that she done it, so they decide that they are going to question her. They take her downstairs. Um, so before they're sort of arresting her or questioning her or doing anything, um, officers, um, before they go into, um interrogating rooms they have to check their weapons before entering the downs- downstairs jail so they sort of take all their weapons off and leave them outside um so the detectives obviously don't want any sort of you know armed standoff if she flew off the handle or anything like that there they just want to um gather insight into what happened you know before letting her know what they knew okay so okay i'm going to play a wee snippet of their but hold on a minute what do they just go to her like house or where do they get her no so like i said she she works so close to them so she um they're basically like look come here would you mind coming in and talking to this um suspect uh we just need your help on something she's like yeah no problem you know we're just going to go into this interrogation room like she works really close by so um they are they sort of tick her in um, so she has no idea that she this has is what they're taking. She has absolutely no idea what this is about. So I'm going to play the recording. Now, this is like an hour long, so obviously I'm not going to play the whole thing. I have listened to the whole thing and I've sort of taken out the snippets of, you know, the, the relevant um, pieces of information. So you can sort of hear that she is completely taken aback, completely taken by surprise. She is like, okay, just listen to it, okay? Okay. We're bring, you're going to bring somebody in, right? Yeah, well, I'll like, oh, explain okay. the whole thing. I don't want to talk about this in the squadron because okay. I, I don't know who people are listening. That's true. That's and if we go to my side, everybody's yeah. always wondering what everybody oh, else yeah, is sure, doing. No problem. Okay. But uh, like we're talking about being busy and stuff, we've been assigned a case that we've been looking at. Okay. okay. It's a new case, and as we're doing the case, there's some notes uh, to see. Uh, as far as your name being mentioned. Do oh, you, okay. Do you know John Rutten? John Rutten? John Rutten? Rutten. Rutten. Oh, yeah, I went to school with him. You did? Yeah. How long did you know him? Gosh, well, I went to school in, um, let's see, went to UCLA in 1978, I started, and, um, you know, met him at school at the dorms. Mm-hmm. Um, were you guys friends, close friends? Yeah, we're very close friends. I yeah. Mean, I mean, what's this all about? Well, it's regarding, it's a case we're working on, and it involves John, and in there, some of the statements we, we reviewed, uh, you know, there's notes and stuff that he, that he knew you and stuff. Oh, yeah, I mean, we good friends, um, lived in the dorms for, I lived in the dorms for two years. Um, you guys lived in the same dorm? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, Dijkstra. Okay, were you guys just friends or anything else, or? Yeah, we were, we were good friends yeah was there ever any relationship or anything to develop between you guys 
yeah, I need to be dated. Uh, uh -huh. You know, um, I mean, is it, what's this all about? Well, it's relating to uh, his wife. Okay. Okay. Did you know her? Not really. I mean, I knew that he got married years ago. Uh-huh. Did you ever meet her? God, I don't know. Um, Do you know who she was or anything? Well, I... Let me think. God, it's been a long time ago. Mm -hmm. um, um, I, I may have met her. Um, geez. You know. Yeah. Uh, well, let me see. Let me ask you. You said you you dated John. How long did you guys date? I mean, well, are you guys? Is this something? I mean, you said I was going to interview somebody about art and how well, you guys are. Here's. here's <laughs> I mean, Stephanie. Here's the situation. It's basically, we, you know, we knew that this uh, when we saw this in the in in this chrono that maybe you know there was some relationship there. That's what the chrono seemed to indicate, and we didn't want to come up to you at your desk and ask those kinds of questions or do anything. You know how up there people can see what's going on if you go into an interview room or people are in there getting oh, supplies. Okay. So we, we wanted to afford you some privacy, some confidentiality okay. to talk about this because we thought it might be, you know, something, you know, you're married to someone else, obviously, and so forth. And I mean, wh wh you know, what's, uh, what's, I mean, what's this all about? I mean... Well, let me ask you, what ended the relationship between you and John? You know, I don't... It was kind of a weird relationship. I mean, we 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 dated. Um, I can't say that he was my boyfriend. I don't know that he would con consider me his girlfriend. Um, we just we dated. We did things. I played sports in college. He played basketball. His brother played basketball. Um, it, it, we just, you know, it just didn't work out. I mean, I don't know what to tell you. It was like I went out with other guys, um, saw other guys. I went on lots of vacations. Um, you know, and, and once you guys split, were you guys still friends or kind of, uh, you know, I problems? Mean, Is it friendly, not friendly? No, I don't think it was not friendly. I mean, we were friendly. Um, uh, I know that we went to Hawaii. You know, I, I don't understand why you're talking about some guy I dated a million years ago. Well, do you know what happened to his wife? Yeah, I know she got killed. What um, did you What did you hear about that? I saw a poster at work. Um, I'm sure I spoke to him about it. Um, I think I spoke to another friend of his about it. Um, and how did how did you first learn about that? Jeez, <laughs> someone could have called me. I could have heard it at work. Um, I may not have known what her last name was. I may have. I mean, maybe if you told me, I would remember it. Um, Do you remember you know. the first name? <sighs> Shelly, um, Sherry, I don't know, something maybe, you know, um, like I said, it's been so many years and... Um, from all the years, as far as you can remember, you don't, do you, do you remember ever talking to her? Just Well, as you say, I said earlier, you know, I, I mean, I may have, you know, I may have talked to her. Um, I, it it sounds, you know... You mentioned a hospital, maybe. You may have talked to her at a hospital. Yeah, um, yeah, I may have, you know, I, I'm, I'm thinking back now, you guys are bringing up all these whole memories. No, it kind of dusts um, off the cuff. You know, I mean, geez. Um, Hold on, well, when, tell me about this uh, the car getting broken into. Well, my car had been broken into several times. Oh, really? Did you ever lose anything, or? Yeah. Now that you mention it, let's see. I had a gun that was stolen. Mm -hmm. um, I had other stuff that was stolen. Not your duty gun, was it? No. Oh, that's good. Um, was it ever recovered? I don't know. No, I don't think so. Not that I know of. Never been notified? No. The car's been broken into, yeah, several times. You know, was John there? Did John say this happened because, and other people were there? I, I just, I don't recall. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just doesn't sound you know, familiar. And this is an incident where you showed up, you weren't supposed to show up, and things got heated. At his house? Yeah. <laughs> that I, you know, you know, it, <coughs> I, I'm trying to give you some background of, you know, how I knew him, and now you're telling me that some somebody's saying that we had this big old fight, and I don't even know what you're talking about, um, you know, and I don't want to, you know, 
get in trouble for something that I didn't even do, or you're saying I did something. Okay, yeah, we understand. I mean, how would you guys like it if the tables were turned on you? I understand. No. Um, no, that's what we're telling you. I mean, you're free to go whenever yeah. you want. If if this makes you uncomfortable and you want to, well, you now you're starting leave. to make me uncomfortable. The thing is, I mean, detectives did what they could at that time on the crime scene. Okay, and the burglary thing you're talking about—that is an angle that they looked at. I go, but now we're looking at everything else on the case because nobody was ever arrested <laughs> on the case. I, I don't know that or not. Okay. Okay, so like she, she is, is panic. She's she is like <laughs> I'm. What the fuck am I going to do? Now? I have put away with this for so long. Twenty three years later. Oh my god! After becoming a super high up detective, they're like, mm, "Do you remember this case?" And she's like, mm, "Yeah, a little bit." Like blah blah blah. And then she's like, at the end, she's like, "I probably need a lawyer." Oh my god! Like the shock she must have got, and she must have been furious as well that she knew nothing about this. Yeah, I'm delighted. <laughs> so once she got up, left the interview room, and as soon as she's outside the room, she is immediately taken into into custody. So the arrest of a female LAPD detective for a cold case murder was instant national, even international news. Yeah. Um, her trial for first degree murder began on February 6th, 2012, and she actually pleaded not guilty. She didn't make any public statements at all during her trial. She sort of um, doesn't really say anything on March 8th. After a five week trial, she was convicted of first degree murder. Oh, my God. So John actually testified. This makes things so much worse. OK. John testified that he reinitiated contact with Stephanie in 1989, about three years after the murder. They met up again when they were both, so they were both in Hawaii for like different reasons. She's on a holiday with someone else and I don't know what he's there for. Um, and then again, they meet in California for, on a couple of separate occasions on the same year. And John says that they met up and they had sex on two different occasions. How oh my God, I hate John. Frustrating. Like, that is so frustrating. I actually can't stand him. I like Sherry. Like Nell was Nell her dad's name. Nell's. He yeah. was right. Like Sherry was far too good for him. I know. I know. Um. So yeah, like that makes things so much worse because it's almost like she got what she wanted, and it's so sad because it's like they ended up in completely different directions anyway. So he actually married someone else. So he marries his second wife, Kim, and he met her in 1991, married her in 1993, started a family with her. She, Stephanie ends up marrying this other guy, Scott, who's also a, a policeman, um, and they adopt a daughter as well. So it's like, it's such a horrific, pointless crime. Um, victim impact. And she, like, she obviously didn't even feel any remorse. She's no. She's not guilty. Ah, exactly. Um, V- victim impact statements were delivered in court by the Rusmussen's family and John Rutten. John, you know, became emotional. Um, Stephanie still doesn't make any remarks, express any remorse. Um, she actually maintains her innocence. So she's like, oh, it's all one big mistake. So she has appealed her um, murder conviction and thankfully all her appeals to date have been denied. Um, um, was Sherry's dad and mom still alive? Yes, they were still alive. They, oh, great. Yeah. So Nels was like, I saw this from the very beginning. If yeah. someone had have listened to me, they actually requested an investigation into the LAPD um, and its investigation into her murder in 1986. Yeah. For more than 30 years, the LAPD has consistently denied any cover-up in the case of Sherry Rasmussen. Um, they never acknowledged that their investigation was mishandled or influenced in any way by the possibility of um, the fact that the law enforcement personnel was involved. But even, remember I said that the girl that found the evidence, uh, all those yeah, years like later... Yeah, that was even brushed aside. That was completely brushed aside again. And she actually... Um, she actually went on to say that she feels like she was reprimanded for trying to get that detective to, to look into it again. And she was sent to like 
um, you know, see a, a, a psychologist. They were basically like, look, you're too emotionally. And she's like, what? Like, I just want this case re-looked at. And they're like, no, no, no. So again, like, it's not like it was just in 1986. It was a, it was almost feels like a continuous thing. Yeah. Um, and to date, uh, no one at the LAPD has been held accountable for any mistakes made in the LAPD's investigation of Sherry Rasmussen's homicide during the 23 years that Stephanie got away with murder. And like, if they had just listened to her parents, to her father, Nels, from the very beginning and investigated Stephanie, then, you know, so much heartache and pain could have been avoided and Sherry could have got justice earlier oh my god that is crazy and that is how sherry rasmussen got justice 23 years after her murder and how a parent's love and a parent's instinct just never ever went away Guys, thank you so much for listening to this week's episode of What's a Crime? We, um, Gemma was um, clued in remotely this time, so I hope that you can hear <laughs> all her comments. <laughs> Maybe they do. Maybe it's better if they don't hear me. <laughs> Maybe, actually. Um, so, yeah, we will be back again next week with a brand new episode of What's a Crime. Gemma, you will possibly be tuning in remotely again. So I will talk to you then as well. Okay. Bye. Bye.